Okay, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay, welcome. I'm really glad you all could join us on this lovely fall evening. A reminder to silence your phones and other distracting devices, and um, we can get started. Uh, format tonight's really straightforward. I'll do a brief introduction, and then Lee will have the floor. Um, he'll talk for a while, and then there'll be time for question and answer. Um, my name is Liza Bernard, and on behalf of the Norman Williams Public Library, uh, we're very happy that you could come to this special event with Lee McColgan, who's the author of A House Restored, The Tragedies and Triumphs of Saving a New England Colonial. Um, I want to thank uh, Woodstock Community TV for recording this talk, which will be available later on their website and on ours, and also to our co-host, the Yankee Bookshop, who um, generously donate a portion of the proceeds from any book sales so that we can continue bringing these authors and having these programs um, here in Woodstock. So, Lee McColgan has worked at Boston's Old North Church, which probably, who hasn't been to the Boston Old North Church? Oh my goodness. Um, it's an amazing building. Uh, he worked on Louisa May Alcott's Orchard House and other buildings. His work has been featured in Architectural Digest, Boston Globe, and was featured in the New York Times just recently. Actually, this house was featured in the New York Times, I believe. It was. It was. Um, he lives with his wife in the Loring House, which is in Pembroke, Massachusetts, sort of along the South Shore. And the house was built in 1702, which makes our Norman Williams Public Library feel very young. Um, and as anyone who's cared for a house knows, there's always unanticipated repairs. But when a house is more than 300 years old, I don't know how he dealt with it. And he committed to use period materials and methods for the work. Oh, and also he was going to have it ready for a Thanksgiving dinner. So without further ado, I'm going to let Lee tell the story. All right. Well, hello, everybody. Okay, so first off, that introduction was very Massachusetts heavy in the house in Massachusetts, but it is great for me to be back in Vermont because a little bit of my backstory that wasn't in the intro, I am a graduate of Rutland High School, <laughs> class of 98. I served with the first 86 field artillery out of Berlin. We did a little deployment to Iraq in 2004. That's a story for another day. And I'm a Johnson State College graduate, which I have learned Johnson State College is no longer a college. I think it is Northern University of Vermont, something different. Anyway, but my background is more Vermont than Massachusetts. So. It is great to be back here. So thank you all for coming. So let's get into this. We're going to talk about three things. And I'll try to keep this to half an hour. Sometimes I go on tangents. It might be 45, but with Q&A, we're going to keep it to an hour. We know you're busy. You've got things to do. And we want to be respectful of your time. So we'll talk about why I wrote this book. It's called The House Restored. We'll get into just a little bit of an overview of what the story is. I don't want to give too much away because I'm hoping you're going to read the book. And I'm going to tell you one story from one of the chapters. So, let's get into it. Why did I write this book? And maybe the suit gives this away. Before I worked in the wonderful world of historic preservation, I had a corporate career. I worked in finance. Any finance people here? One, a couple, okay. No offense to my finance people. When you tell people you work in finance, it's not necessarily the profession. They say, oh my goodness, that's amazing work for saving the world. But I thought, when I got into historic preservation, salvaging these old buildings, these, this wonderful, these architectural treasures that give our towns this character, the character that makes New England, Vermont, Massachusetts, unique, wonderful places, I thought everybody would get excited about that. I thought everybody would want to save old buildings and see the value to saving these old buildings. And very quickly, what did I find out? Is that true? No. Does everybody want to save old buildings? No, no of course not. 
You realize maybe every old building is a battle. I've been to many a contentious town hall meetings. You're fighting developers. Sometimes you're fighting the town yourself. And I've realized, oh no, for someone that sees the world the way I do, that sees the value of saving these buildings, how can I get people on the other side of this issue to see the world my way? Because we've got options. Are we all old house people here? Show of hands, I'm generally preaching the choir here, but I never know. So of course we can regulate, that is one option. Sometimes though, this is what I've learned, people spend a lot of money to buy a house. In some cases it's the most expensive asset that they have. And when you are on the board of your historic society, as I have been, or if you are part of the historic commission, and you are the organization that is telling people what they can or cannot do with their house, they don't always get happy with that because people don't like being told what to do. So, as much as I am in favor of regulation, I thought maybe there's another way we can win the hearts and minds when we know a little bit more of some, about something, anything, doesn't have to be old houses, this is where we can develop an appreciation for it. So I thought, maybe I'll tell a little story, I'll give you a little history, we'll talk about preserving an old house, I'll talk about why it matters, some of my own philosophical rants on this topic, a little history rabbit holes, maybe we'll give some folks some appreciation as to why saving these things matter, and that culminated in this book, A House Restored. So, what is the story, generally? My wife and I, about seven, eight years ago, we decided to buy a house that was built in 1702 that had been largely untouched. I always say, a woman that lived in it, her name is Lydia Hale, she lived there for 40 years or so. She was a wonderful preservationist, by which I mean what? She did nothing. She did nothing to the house. Now, that is why we bought it, because I wanted an old house that wasn't gutted. I wanted all the early building fabric to survive. But when someone doesn't touch a house for 40 years, especially when it's a house that's already been sitting there for 300 years, there are going to be some major projects that you have to undertake. So, as I'm getting into this, coming up with my plan, where to start, what's the best way to tackle this thing, my lovely wife Liz has a wonderful idea. She always wanted to buy a big property so we could have friends and family get together and we could host. And she says, why don't we have next year's Thanksgiving at our house? This will give me 18 months to put this house in somewhat of more presentable order before a couple guests, a couple dozen guests are going to be showing up on my doorstep. To which I say, what? Of course I can do that. <laughs> what could go wrong? 18 months, all the time in the world. I'm a handy guy, no problem. And that is where our story begins. <laughs> so, I am getting into this. Who lives in an old house? We must have some old house people here, okay. You cannot live in an old house, even a new house, and not deal with some projects from time to time. So always there is a question with every project. What is the best way to go about this? Do I call a contractor and have them come do the work? Sometimes you call 10 contractors and you're lucky if any of them call you back, depending on how busy they are. Sometimes they start a job and then they jump to another job and you don't see them for long periods of time. I don't know what your experience with contractors has been. I've been on both sides of it, but that can be up in the air. 
You've got another option. You can do the work yourself. Where are my DIYers? Who does the work themselves? Anyone? A couple? A few? There's always a few. So then what do you do? Do you go to the hardware store, the box store, the Home Depot? You just get some materials there, throw them in the truck, drive them home. Lots of different options. So I'm doing my research. I'm thinking about all this. I've tinkered a little bit, but I, haven't, I don't have a construction background. And I am reading a book. And I come across a very interesting account. That will change the course of this project. Does anyone read anything from an author named Nathaniel Philbrick, or have you heard of him? OK. He's most well known. He wrote a book called In the Heart of the Sea. It's about a little ship that got sunk by a whale. Real life story, Herman Melville based the end of Moby Dick off of this real life story. Wrote a book about that, big success, won a National Book Award. Ron Howard bought the film rights, made a Hollywood movie out of it. I thought the book was better than the movie. But before any of that success, I got to meet Nat, he's a nice guy. Before any of that, he wrote a little sleepy history. He lives out on the island of Nantucket, off the coast of Massachusetts, Cape Cod. And he wrote a little sleepy book about Nantucket and its people. And if you don't live in Nantucket, you probably don't care that much about Nantucket and its people. Maybe you do. But I like this stuff. I was reading this book. And in it, I come across an account of an 18th century builder. His name is Richard Macy. This is an impressive fellow to me. Because when Richard Macy wants to build a house, this is the pre-industrial age, he does everything by himself. If he needs stones, what does he do? He goes to the common ground and collects them with his bare hands. If he needs wood for the frame, what does he do? He gets an ax and he chops the trees down himself and hews them square. If there aren't trees of the right dimension on the island, he gets in a boat, he goes off the island, he cuts trees down on the mainland, he hauls them back. If he needs plaster for walls or for mortar, he collects shells on the beach and he fires them in what is called a lime brick converting calcium carbonate into a white creamy putty that can be used for plastering and mortar. If he needs hardware, he rots it with himself, does a little blacksmithing too. Pretty impressive guy, would you agree? I was quite impressed by this. Here is the thing, however. Books can be dangerous things because sometimes they give us ideas. And when I read this account, ideas. the light bulb went off. And I had an idea. And what was that idea? I have a plan for my restoration work. I will follow in the footsteps of this Macy character. I will do everything myself. If I want to preserve the character of this old house, What's the best way to do that? Well, use the same methods that were used when it was first built in the 18th century. So I will do everything myself, and I will use pre-industrial tools and technology, and this is going to be a great thing. Is this a good idea? No. no, this is a terrible idea. I don't recommend that any of you try this yourself. So, let's get into this. I'm going to tell one story. So I start. It's a Georgian colonial two-engine, the central passageway, and like a lot of these old houses, it's been stitched and pieced together over the years. So there's a big colonial in the front, a little L off the back of that, 20th century edition off the back of that. This is the L off the back of the house, probably built somewhere in the early 1800s. It is timber framed. Do we have any experts on timber framing? Do we have anyone that knows any? You must know a little bit about, anyone know anything about timber framing? All right, we got a little bit of timber framing. We're gonna talk about it, you'll learn a thing. So it's timber frame. Most of the old part of the house has not been touched. 
As you can see from this picture, it, this room has had layers and layers of stuff added to it over the years. Layers of flooring, this is common. In between these exposed timbers, we've got all sorts of paneling. There is that, and no offense if anybody likes it, but wall to wall, that brown veneer paneling that in the 1970s we were putting up everywhere. Who's doing that? I see some gray hair. Someone is responsible for putting up that veneer paneling in the 70s. So this is covered with it. There is a dubious section. So typically a timber frame is exposed and only the infill between the beams is covered over. There is a dubious section in the corner where the brown paneling crawls out and wraps itself around part of the frame too. <laughs> that should have got my attention, but I didn't think too much about it. So I am thinking this will be a good place to start. It is mostly going to be cosmetic. I will just tear up this flooring and probably find some beautiful early wood floors underneath. Question? Question. Yeah. What kind of floor is that? Is that tile or? That is a sheet. It's a linoleum, like it came out in a big roll. It is just but when that came up, there was tile under that, and there was about three or four layers under that. Yes. So there was, they had built. When you put new stuff down, rather than rip the old layer up, just keep adding on top of it, saves you some time. So that had happened for years. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's that. And then we've got our paneling, and I'm thinking though, this is gonna be cosmetic. I'll just tear all this stuff up and get back to this early, earlier period for this house, and this will be the easy part. So, has anyone torn this paneling off, this brown paneling? Have you ever taken this stuff out? Yeah. All right. So I start with the paneling. And this is the thing about a project. Anytime you get started on a new project, this is the most exciting part. That's right. Because the possibilities are endless. Oh, this is going to be great. It's all going to work out perfectly. I'm going to tear this paneling off, and what am I going to find underneath? There could be anything under there. There could be nice early horsehair plaster smeared on there. Maybe there's some fun old Victorian era wallpaper that's been untouched. Question? Mice. There could be mice, but that's less exciting. Less exciting. There's always that dream of mine that I'm going to open and there was some old pilgrim that lived in this house, and they put some gold coins in some <laughs> satchel, and they hid it in the wall, that's where they're storing their wealth, and they forget to tell their kids, and then they die, and it's hidden in the wall, and I'm going to uncover some great treasure, and I'll be able to retire. So I'm excited. So I get my crowbar, three foot long crowbar, and this panel, it breaks apart really easily, so you want to be gentle. So what you do, if you haven't done this before, you find a seam, and you wedge the crowbar under the seam, and you gently start working it down the seam. So this is what I am doing, excited about all the possibilities. And this stuff starts wiggling, wiggling, and the nails are coming loose, and it's cracking, and it's popping, and the dust is coming up, and I'm trying to get this panel off in one piece, and I'm excited about all these things. Am I going to find any of that great stuff? No, my panel comes off and I find nothing. <laughs> I find a hole in the corner of the frame. This is a little further in the process. There was still a roof at that point. But the frame itself, where there is supposed to be a frame, I literally find a hole. None of the components of this frame are tied together. All of them are whittled down like a beaver has chewed on them into a little nub. And I am staring at that wondering, how is this structure not falling down on my very head? I throw my crowbar down. It climbs on the floor. I run out to the barn. I rummage through some wood. I get some four by fours. One under each arm. I come back in. I saw them. I'm propping them under this thing. And I'm wondering, how am I not being flattened? And the answer, the answer, if you are wondering, if you look at these vertical sheathing boards, they are a lot more structural than one would imagine. 
it turns out the whole corner of your frame can be gone and the sheathing boards will hold the structure <laughs> up. But, but, this is a problem. So let's talk about the corner of a timber frame structure of this period. It is English built, and for that reason, you maybe know this, you're an architectural historian. Architectural historians give it a name. You know it? You don't know it? All right, you're learning something new too. It is called the English tying joint, and it is one of the most elaborate parts of a timber frame structure. What we get is the convergence of four components. We have a post, and if you ever see the posts in these old timber frame buildings, they're fat at the top and they taper down. Some people call them gunstock posts because they look like a gunstock. The English call them jowl posts because they have a big cheek. The reason you have that is you need enough material to fit these two tenons that run perpendicular to each other. So you have your post. Then you have a beam called the wall plate. It runs along the eave end of the structure and it sits on one of these tenons. Then you have another beam that runs along the gable end. It ties the two walls together. What do you think they call that? It ties the two ends of the room together. Tie beam. Thank you, tie beam. I give you a hand. Good job. We got there together. We got there together. It is called a tie beam. You have a rafter that runs down from the ridge, and all of this is interlocked with mortise and tendon joinery. Oh, by the way, there's a little dovetail cut in the bottom of the tie beam that sits in a recess cut to match it in the wall plate. Lincoln logs, did we all do Lincoln logs when we grow up? It all fits together like that. And then what they would do is they would drill holes through these joints and hammer pegs through them. And this is how a frame in this period can stay together without what? Nails! We don't even need nails. The wooden pegs and mortise and tenon joinery hold it together. Pretty impressive how they built wood frame houses in this period. As impressive as that is, when you are standing in your kitchen with the clock ticking and your English tying joint is nowhere to be found, that is an intimidating situation. So, I decide, maybe it's time to abandon this plan to be Mr. Richard Mason, do it all myself. Maybe I need a little bit of help. I'm gonna to try to find a modern day timber framer. Where do you find a modern day timber framer? Vermont's a good place to start. But I'm not up here. Where else do you find one? Shipyards. Shipyards? Yeah. That's a good idea. Here's what I remember. So I'm from Massachusetts. I moved to Vermont when I was 10. If you grow up down in the South Shore area, there's a living history museum in Plymouth. This is where the pilgrims came, and it is called Plymouth Plantation. And every kid that grows up down there is taken to this museum on a field trip has anyone been to Plymouth Plantation before? Okay, well, that's good. So most people, you go down there because you gotta go see Plymouth Rock. Who's seen the rock? And what do we all think when we see the rock? Oh, it's small. It's a lot smaller than I thought it was gonna be. I think everyone has the same thought. And I've just driven all the way down there to see a rock. Now what do I do? It takes about five seconds to see a rock. Well, I'll go over to Plymouth Plantation. So, I remember going there as a kid. I remember seeing rows of reproduced pilgrim houses, and I said, I bet they'll know a little something about timber framing. <sighs> so I get in my car, and I drive down to Plymouth Plantation, and I pay for my ticket, and I go into the grounds, and just as I recall, there are these two beautiful rows of reproduced pilgrim houses, and I'm thinking, this is great. These people are gonna help me, but, if you remember, the people that are working on the grounds at Plymouth Plantation, they are costumed interpreters. <laughs> and they are given a character to play. And this is one passage on what? The Mayflower. And they are told, from what I learned, very, very strictly, do not break character. character. So put yourself in my shoes. I'm trying to have a modern 21st 
says to be conversational about Timber Fraley, and I'm going from person to person, and I'm not getting any information. I'm getting people going about their 17th century day that will not break character. I am getting William Bradford's backstory, and Edward Winslow, and Dippin' Candles, and Churning Butter, and whatever else kind of stuff they were doing back then, but nobody will have a normal conversation with me. This is a frustrating thing. So finally, finally, there is a woman, and she sees, she sees my plight. She sees the frustration, and she's got the whole thing on, the linen dress, the big felt hat, the apron, the whole garb. And she waves. She calls me over. And I look over, and I see her. And she's tucked behind the corner of one of these houses. Shh, come here. Me? Yeah, you, come here. So I follow her over. And we're on the side. We're, by, we're away from the people. We're tucked behind this building. And she's looking over her shoulder. I don't know what they do to these people. Yeah. They break character, but they take it really seriously. She's looking over her shoulder. She can't let anyone see that she's having a conversation with me. And then she leads in. And she's talking in a whisper. <laughs> and now I'm answering her in a whisper. Why am I talking in a whisper? I've got nothing to hide. And she said, the person you need to talk to name is Michael Burry. He built most of these, and he knows everything about Timber Frank. And I say, this is great. Where is he? And she says, he doesn't work here anymore. <laughs> <sighs> but, but, she has a phone number. She gives me his number. So I call, and he answers. I got a picture. Michael, on top of a new timber frame. Michael teaches preservation carpentry, a little program. There's a school in Boston. It's the oldest trade school in the country, They're dedicated to preserving these lost arts. It's called the North Bennett Street School. Burry is their preservation carpentry instructor. I track him down. He's on a job site. I learned that Mr. Burry likes to take on an apprentice every summer. And what do I say? I've got just the guy from you. <laughs> Leaving the corporate world to be the apprentice of preservation carpentry instructor Michael Burry. Financially, is this a good idea? <laughs> no! Am I going to do it anyway? Yeah. Yes! This tells you a lot about my personality. So, I go work for Michael. Has anyone worked with any of these preservation people before? Nobody? All right. One, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Don't tell anybody. It's between us. They're all hoarders. <laughs> Here's what happens. These old buildings are going to get demolished. And they can't stop it. So they do the next best thing. When we hear that one of these old buildings is going to get raised, it's like the bat signal goes out <laughs> to all the preservation and they get in their beat up old trucks. They're all beat up old trucks, every one of them. And they get some tools together and they drive down. And if they can't save the house in its entirety, they do the next best thing, which is what? Save the room. They scrap the thing and take as much stuff as they can load in the backs of their beat up old trucks and drive it home. And when they get home, where do they put it? They put it in the attic. And then the attic goes up. And then where do they put it? They start stuff in the basement, and then the basement fills up, and then they go up to the garage, and they start putting stuff in the garage, and then the garage fills up, and then before you know it, they just start putting it on the front lawn! <laughs> and you get piles if you go to Michael Burry's house. He's been doing this for decades. There are piles that are taller than me. And when you work as an apprentice, every now and again, a job comes along, and you need the one thing that is down here in the pile that is this high. And what is my job? Move all that stuff so we can get to the thing down here. This is not glamorous work. I had a VP title in my previous life, vice president. Now I'm moving crap on Michael Burry's lawn. But it's all worth it. Those little tricks of the trade, the things that a man like him can pass on. 
how to cut a tendon, how to chisel out a mortise, how to sharpen an old hand plane. This is where the gold is. You just have to be patient. So I finish up my summer with Michael. I get back to the Loring house. I'm still stuck on following in the footsteps of this Richard Macy character. When Macy needed wood for his frame, what did he do? Cut down trees. He cut the trees down himself with an axe. I thought about it. Don't get me wrong. I walked around in the forest in the backyard. I was looking at trees, thinking maybe I'll just fell one of these trees. I do have some sense, despite what you've learned about me so far. <laughs> so I decided to have a sawmill, cut me some beams, and drop them off on my driveway on a flatbed truck. But there is one thing, one thing I could not get past. These old beams. They used to cut these trees down, and then they would hew them by hand big broad axe. And if you look very close, they used a double beveled axe in the 17th and early 17th, 18th, early part of the 19th century. And when they hew these things, it cuts these little scoops of wood out when you go in one of these old buildings. And the light hits the beams just right. And you see those hundreds of scallop marks. You appreciate it because you know how much work went into it. And for those of us that appreciate this stuff, it's an amazing thing. So I can't just have sawn beams put in there. I need those little scallop marks. <laughs> so what do I do? I have them cut my beam a little wider, and then I will hew it myself to get that finished look. Has anyone hewn a beam before? You've hewn, we've got two that have hewn a beam before. All right. Has anyone else seen this done before? All right. So for those of you that don't know, that's more hands than I usually get. If you don't know, this is what it looks like. This is coming from an Eric Sloan book. If you ever read Eric Sloan stuff, you wrote this back in the 1950s. I didn't actually hew a beam with Michael, so I didn't have any experience. I just had this picture to go on and whatever videos I could find on the internet. It is a two-part process. The first thing you're doing is cutting a series of notches in the log. You're severing the long cellulose fibers in the wood, so when you hack at it with the broad axe, you don't get tear out. So you cut these little pizza shaped wedges, sever that grain, and then hop down, take a big broad axe, and swipe at it until you start hacking it clear. Question, sir. What is a double beveled axe? What is that? So bevel on two sides. So in the 17th century, 18th century, it's got a bevel on both sides. And that, when you cut, will you kind of hit, and it leaves these little scoops. They wanted a cleaner finish to timber frame structures when we get into the 1800s, and they started using a single bevel, so it cuts a little bit more square. Sometimes they would use an adz to clean these up, and then you'll see little choppy adz marks on there. So you go to these things, you can kind of, once you work with the stuff, you kind of get a good understanding for what marks they leave. Is one of these a double bevel axe in the picture? Uh, he, it's hard to tell because it's just a Sloan drawing, but this picture, based on what they're wearing, looks a little later. They're probably using a single beveled axe, but we're getting really into the weeds now. So here's, I'm going to step back away from that. Here's the bigger issue. What do you see when you look at the gentleman in the top illustration? What are they doing? They're just marking the... Well, they're cutting. Well, what are they, how are they cutting that log? They're standing. Where? Oh, they're standing on top of the log. And they have a razor sharp axe to cut those little notches. And where are they swinging it? <laughs> this is the key point. Where? Between, between their feet. So put yourself in my shoes. My beam is dropped off in my driveway. I drag it to the back corner. I wait till Liz is at work somewhere. She can't see this ridiculousness. Maybe that's a mistake. And I get my brand new razor sharp felling axe and I get up on my beam. Picture me standing there, looking down, taking that first swing. I am going to start swinging a razor sharp axe where? Between my feet. Is this a good idea? No. Am I going to do it anyway? Yes. But I am thinking of the worst case scenarios. What if I chop off a toe? 
I will have to climb off of said log and root around on all fours in the grass, hoping I can find said toe, hoping it can be stitched on before it turns black and withery, hoping I can get it on ice. These are the things I'm thinking about, but I have to commit. So finally, I take a breather. I wipe the sweat from my brow. I raise my axe up like a medieval executioner about to chop off a head. And I swing with all my might. And what happens? It skips off the log and almost cuts off my toe. <laughs> it didn't. Don't worry. My toes are fine. So I get back up, and I swing again, and I swing again, and before you know it, it's just like the sports, golf, we play golf, pickleball, tennis, what do you do? whatever the heck you do, it's all muscle memory, and after a while, you just get into a rhythm. So I hack and hack away, and then I get my broad axe, and by the end of a weekend, there is my hand-hewn gunstock post. And I figure out how to cut those fancy tenons, and I lug it into the house, and I cut away all the rotted stuff, like a dentist drilling out an old nasty tooth, and I patch in these pieces. This is another picture of it. This is me setting the piece in. So you don't have to replace the whole beam. You can just tie a little, what we call a scarf joint. You can just tie a little repair piece in there. So I fit this all together, and lo and behold, after a few weekends, I have restored my English time joints. I'll take a round of applause. I was waiting. I was waiting. Thank you. Thank you. And I am feeling pretty good. So, if starting a project is one of the best parts, the second best part, especially when you get yourself in a big mess, is when you dig yourself back out of that hole. And I am basking, basking in the glow of self accomplishment. And I go into the bathroom. And I'm washing up, feeling good. Smile ear to ear. I'm washing my hands. All the dirt's come covered in sawdust and all the stuff's coming off. And it's all on my face. And I'm getting the stuff off my face. And I'm leaning into the mirror to make sure I got it all. And when you lean into a mirror, what happens to the reflection behind it? It's bigger. The closer you get to a mirror, the more of the reflection you see behind you. And as I am looking at the mirror, I see something up on the ceiling. It is a large black spot. And I don't remember seeing this when we first walked through the house. And I'm looking at it, and I'm thinking, what the hell is that? That, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of chapter one. <laughs> so, this is our story. This book is not about Pembroke, Massachusetts. We don't care about that town unless you live there. It is not about the stuffy old English guy, Tom Lauren, who had a house built back in the 18th century. The protagonist of the story is the house. It is about six materials. Wood, lime, iron, stone, glass, and brick. These are the materials needed to build a house of this period. Each chapter follows the same structure. I'm going to do this like Richard Macy all myself. I get into a big mess, quickly get in over my skis, realize I need some help, find another one of these modern day builders. They're all eccentric characters. They make for great characters in a book. I learn these old fashioned arts. I go back to the house. I fix the problem. And just when everything is looking great, something else goes wrong. <sighs> I give you a little history about these materials and each thing, but all of this is moving forward on an 18 month deadline. The clock is ticking. Thanksgiving is coming. I have 18 months. Will I make it there on time? I can't tell you that. You have to read the book. <laughs> so, that is a house restore. I'm going to come full circle, closing comments, then I'll take questions we have. How are we doing on time? Are we good? All right. I opened this presentation. What did I say? Why did I write this book? Have we already forgotten?
forgotten this was only like a half an hour ago. I know it's late, but work with me, people. I want to get people more excited about historic <laughs> preservation, so they stop holding these things that give our character this wonderful, unique, give our towns a wonderful, unique character. So, did this to create more advocacy for historic preservation. Very specifically, didn't write this about Pembroke or Glory, because I know most people don't care. I want a story that will resonate with a larger group of people. And this has worked. We've been in the New York Times. We've been in the Boston Globe. We have an upcoming piece in Yankee Magazine. I was on WBUR Radio Boston. We were nominated for a New England Book Award. Didn't win, but we got a nomination. <laughs> I am traveling everywhere I can telling the story to try to get people excited about historic preservation, but I cannot do it alone. <laughs> we're all old house people, right? Yes. I need your help, please. Oh, please help me. What? Sales hat on. What is the best thing you can do to help me? Buy the book. Buy the book. <laughs> listen, listen. You don't have to like it. <laughs> if you read this book and you don't like this book, it won't hurt my feelings. Take the book, turn to any page you like, and tear that page out and crinkle it up in a ball and go over to your drafty window and stuff it in that drafty window. Winter is on the way. Turn to another page. Tear it out. Crumple it up. Set it down on your hearth. Start your next fire with it. The pages are dry. If you don't like it, I don't care. Do you have a wobbly table in your home? These old floors are wavy. Stuff this thing under that short leg. It'll prop that table up just fine and dandy. I don't care what you do it if you don't like it. If you like it, though, please, oh, please, tell somebody. Share it. Spread the word. I cannot do this alone. The more people that are excited about historic preservation, the more people get behind these projects, the fewer of these contentious battles we have to have to save the next building that's on the chopping block, the more money we can raise. The more money we can raise, the more buildings we save. My name is Lee McColgan. This is The House Restored. Thank you for listening to me.